This lecture will cover some of the common analytical techniques used in molecular pathology, hematopathology, and even in research laboratories. My goal with this lecture is to provide a high yield summary of these tests, how they're performed, their limitations, and their usefulness. I will not be discussing the technical aspects in great detail. I think there are plenty of well-established resources for that. The content here is primarily geared towards pathology residents, um, and it is common to see these topics on boards as well as in-service exams. Having said that, though, I think uh, the content would be useful uh, to a range of science backgrounds, including academic researchers, medical students, uh, or anyone that's interested, really. There is a lot to cover in this lecture. Um, it is pretty long, and uh, this is by no means a comprehensive list of molecular tests. However, these topics are important and can be difficult to understand, especially if you haven't had much exposure to them or you're just starting out uh, studying for them. Now, you probably don't want to sit through content you are already familiar with, so if you would like to skip ahead to a subject, feel free to click on the topic header now to jump to that subject. Or you can also find the timestamps for the topics listed in the description below. We're going to start with karyotyping. In the clinical setting, it's important to know that karyotyping requires living cells to grow in culture. This means no fixed tissues or terminally differentiated cell lines can be used. The process of preparing the sample for karyotype analysis is pretty straightforward. You grow up the cells of interest in culture. Some cells may need encouragement, such as lymphocytes from a blood sample, and others have no problem taking off, such as malignant cells. You then arrest the cells in metaphase, using colchicine to inhibit the mitotic spindles from forming. A hypotonic solution is then added to swell the cells and increase their fragility. And then they are placed in a special fixative to keep them in this engorged state. You then drop the cells onto a slide from a height of about two feet or so, disrupting the cell and nuclear membranes and spreading the chromatin out onto the slide. And finally, the slide is stained in order to visualize the banding patterns on the chromosomes. The entire process can take a few days to complete. The slide is then examined, scanned into a digital format, and using sophisticated software, technicians identify and sort the chromosomes neatly onto a carrier gram. The report that goes out follow the same nomenclature rules we discussed in part one of this series. If you need a refresher on those rules, please see that video or you can go to the International System for Human Cytogenomic Nomenclature, or ISCN, uh, to review. Now, not every abnormality you see on the slide is considered clonal. Remember that we had to grow these cells in vitro prior to the karyotyping process. This has the potential to introduce new mutations in the cells. Then there is also the preparation of the slide. It is possible that chromosomes spread too far, resulting in artificial loss. So we have certain criteria for calling clonality. First, more than one cell must have the same abnormality to call it clonal. Second, if there is a loss of a chromosome, at least three cells must share the same loss to call this an abnormality. If no abnormalities can be identified, then a minimum of 20 metaphases must be fully analyzed. If there is an abnormality, then at least 10 metaphases must be analyzed. The next few slides are for your practice. So, given this karyogram, what would you say the karyotype and the associated disease are? This is 47XXY, also known as Klinefelter syndrome. What would be the karyotype and associated disease here? 
This is a translocation between chromosome 4 and 11, seen in about 5% of B-cell ALLs, uh, portends a poor prognosis in these patients. And here, this is 45XO, also known as Turner syndrome. So when do we use karyotypes? Um, they're used to help establish a neoplastic diagnosis, such as in myelodysplasia, to determine a specific subtype of a neoplasm, such as in uh, genetically defined acute myeloid leukemias, to gain prognostic information about a neoplastic process, or for disease and treatment monitoring by tracking a previously established clone. Fluorescent in situ hybridization, or FISH, Unlike karyotyping, FISH does not require living cells nor dividing cells. It can be performed on interface cells as well as paraffin embedded or even air dried samples. The technical aspects are much faster than karyotyping. The sample is first dehydrated, usually with ethanol. Fluorescently labeled probes designed to target specific DNA sequences are then applied and the slide is heated to denature the DNA to make space for those probes. The sample is then incubated for several hours at a specific temperature to allow the probes to localize and bind to their target sequences. The final step is then to wash off any excess probes that did not bind and counter stain the DNA with DAPI, uh, which gives that blue fluorescent background it is also worth mentioning that RNA probes exist, uh, but the more common clinical applications involve DNA probes. And again, visually, uh, we prepare our probe DNA with a fluorescent tag. Uh, in this case, we're using purple. We denature the sample DNA to allow the probe to localize to the complementary sequences in the genome. We incubate that sample to set the probe at its target, and then we wash away the excess probe uh, prior to fluorescent microscopy. Now, there are several types of fluorescent probes out there. Uh, here are a couple examples. Um, whole chromosome paints, which, tar which tag the entire chromosome one color. There are enumeration probes that target repetitive DNA sequences near centromeres. Uh, to help count the individual uh, chromosomes. This is an example of whole chromosome painting, known as spectral karyotyping, or SKY. Also shown here are two phases of a cell cycle. The sphere in the top left is a cell in interphase, and in the middle are the condensed metaphase chromatin prior to cell division. And while I'm here, uh, I'll mention briefly, in terms of nomenclature, the prefix nuke-ish describes a fish study performed in interphase, whereas the prefix ish is a study performed on metaphase cells. So, if you see a question with a picture of a big circle, and they ask you what the abnormality is, you can automatically cross off any answers that don't have the nuke-ish prefix. More commonly in medicine, you will see the use of dual fusion and break-apart probes, so I'm going to spend a little more time on these two as they can be confusing. Dual fusion probes are two separate probes, each binding to a different sequence on the genome. Each of the probes will span the breakpoint known to be involved in a translocation. If the sequence breaks, the probes break with it. If a translocation occurs between the two probed sequences, then the broken probes come into proximity with one another, resulting in a combined signal. In the world of fluorescence, red and green signals come together to make yellow. So you will see two yellow signals uh, if a translocation had occurred with break-apart probes. In a normal cell, you will have two separate signals for each probe, each labeling the pair of chromosomes. 
meaning you should normally have two red and two green signals. If a translocation occurs between two, two different chromosomes, a part of the red probe and a part of the green probe will come together and form a yellow signal. Because this translocation occurs between two labeled chromosomes, you get two yellow signals. The uninvolved pairs of chromosomes retain their individual red or green signal. Break apart probes are useful if only one translocation breakpoint is known. These probes can only tell you that a translocation occurred. They do not identify the translocation partner. These probes are designed with two colors flanking the breakpoint sequence. So in our example, we'll stick with red and green. For break apart probes, normal is having the red and green signal in close proximity or in other words, a yellow signal. If a translocation occurs, the red and green signals then separate. Visually, normal is two yellow signals. If a break occurs at the probe sequence, the red half of the probe and the green half of the probe split, resulting in two new signals. Now keep in mind that Complex patterns can emerge for both dual fusion and break apart probes, but the basics have been laid out for you here. Let's practice. What is the probe being used here? These are dual fusion probes. Notice the normal signal being two separate red and green signals. What is the disease depicted on the right? This is a translocation, 1517, between PAMO and RARA, a favorable prognosis in AML. The thin arrows point to normal, uninvolved alleles, while the thick arrows point to the reciprocal translocations. What type of probe do we have here? This is a break-apart probe, two normal yellow signals. If I told you the CBFB gene is located on chromosome 16, what disease process may this fish result on the right represent? AML can result from an inversion 16 or a translocation 1616. Here, the thick arrows point to the normal uninvolved alleles, while the thin arrows point to the rearranged uh, allele. And we'll end on an easy one. This is a enumeration probe uh, demonstrating trisomy 21. Let's talk about microarrays. For comparison, karyotyping has the ability to detect large abnormalities on the order of four to five megabase pairs. Abnormalities smaller than that can be overlooked or entirely missed. FISH does significantly better with a genomic resolution as low as 40 kilobases per probe. But FISH requires some knowledge beforehand in order to target the suspected abnormality and is usually focused on what is being tested. Microarrays have a slightly better resolution still at around 30 kilobases and can be designed to look at the entire genome without any prior information or suspected abnormalities. A chromosomal microarray study allows us to analyze copy number variants. Since I didn't cover CNVs in part one, I'll briefly talk about them here. So copy number variation, or CNV, is a structural phenomenon in which a stretch of DNA can be repeated more than once. This segment of DNA may contain several genes, such as oncogenes. CNVs are estimated to account for approximately 5 to 10 percent of the human genome, and the repeats vary from person to person, hence the word variation. So, for example, there may be a stretch of DNA containing several important genes, and this segment of DNA is repeated four times in one person, 
giving that person four copies of every gene on that segment of DNA. Someone else may only have three copies of that segment of DNA. Obviously, this affects the dosage of certain genes and therefore can have consequences in disease processes. We know, for example, some tumors have been associated with elevated copy numbers of particular genes. Overall, CNV are much more common than we originally knew, and we are still learning a lot about their presence and function. Now, where microarrays outshine fish and karyotyping is in their ability to detect microduplications and microdeletions genome-wide at a higher resolution. Microarrays come in various flavors, but the ones more commonly used and tested on include array-based comparative genomic hybridization, or ACGH arrays, and SNP-based arrays. ACGH can detect genomic imbalances such as copy number changes, but it cannot detect uniparental disomy. You need SNP arrays to do that. So for clarification, uniparental disomy is the result of a neutral loss of heterozygosity, meaning that one parent's gene or even an entire chromosome is missing but the other parent's gene or chromosome is duplicated to compensate for that loss. Think about imprinting diseases like Angelman's. This allelic imbalance, again, is only detected by SNP arrays. Both ACGH and SNP arrays share the same basic method. The difference is really in terms of the probes on the array slide, whether they are targeted to SNPs or to the other uh, sites on the genome as a whole. A microarray uses thousands of probes to cover a wide range of the genome. Unlike in fish, however, the probes are fixed to the microarray chip. Identical probes are clustered together and separated from non-identical sequences. This produces a grid, or an array, on a chip. The genetic material we want to test is then fluorescently labeled, not the probes. We also label a reference sample with a different fluorescent tag so that a comparison can be achieved. Both samples are then allowed to hybridize to the probes on the microarray chip. A computer detects imbalances in genetic material based on the ratio of the two signals at each probed sequence and the results are read out as a log to ratio. What that looks like is depicted here. In this example, we extract genetic material from a sample of tumor and label it in red. Normal DNA from a reference genome is labeled in green. The genetic material from both is fragmented to allow them to bind to the smaller probes on the microarray chip. We then add both samples to the microarray and allow them to hybridize to the probes on that chip. Each dot on the microarray chip represents a unique genomic sequence. If the genetic material from the tumor and the reference genome bind in equal amounts, this results in a yellow signal at that sequence. If, let's say, at a particular point in the tumor genome, there is an amplification of genetic material, then it will bind to those probes at that site in larger amounts than the reference genome, resulting in a red signal. The opposite is also true. If there is a deletion of genetic material within a specific site of the tumor, then it will bind in lesser quantities than the reference genome, resulting in a green signal. Because of the thousands and thousands of probes uh, used on microarrays, a computer is really required to read out the microarray and synthesize the data for us to interpret. This is an example of ACGH microarray data. On the y-axis is our intensity, or log-2 ratio, and on the x-axis is uh, our chromosomes. Each blue dot 
is a probe sequence from the microarray chip. A normal ratio is zero, meaning there is equal amounts of tumor DNA and reference genome DNA. A positive ratio means there is more genetic material from the tumor than the reference genome. And a negative signal uh, means there is less genetic material from the tumor. So in this example, we can see that the terminal end of chromosome 1 has a positive ratio, indicating the tumor has ge additional genetic material within this region. In chromosome 7, there appears to be a deletion of genetic sequences in the tumor, indicating uh, a negative ratio. And because this patient is female, we can see that the X chromosome is well within the positive range, indicating um, two X chromosomes. We can also zoom in on each chromosome to get a better look. The pink dotted line here indicates the centromere. And here we can see chromosome 10, the Q arm has a gain of genetic material. Whereas here in chromosome 11, there is a loss of genetic material within the P-arm. This can also be reported on a carrier gram as bars adjacent to the chromosome, um, green for gain and red for loss. SNP microarray data adds another layer of information. But before we dive into SNP arrays, I would like to clarify how SNPs are reported here. If you recall from part one, a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, is a single nucleotide variation that occurs at a specific site in the genome and is present in more than 1% of the population. By convention, the most common allele at each SNP locus is a capital A and the less common allele is a capital B. Since there are two copies of each chromosome, the possible allelic combinations are AA, AB, or BB, depending on the SNP at that locus. So in this example, we see a homozygous SNP on the left, meaning the nucleotide at this locus is the same on both the paternal and maternal chromosomes. And since this guanine nucleotide is found in the majority of people in the population, we designate this with the capital A. Being homozygous SNP of the major allele, this gets reported as AA. If this locus were homozygous for the minor allele, known to be a T at this locus, it would be reported as a BB. As another example, we have a heterozygous SNP on the right. At this locus, the paternal chromosome demonstrates a major allele, so we designate that with A. And the maternal chromosome demonstrates a minor allele, so we designate that one as capital B. The SNP array result here would be AB. Here's what that will look like. SNP arrays display three allelic tracks representing homozygous AA, homozygous BB, and heterozygous AB. It is normal to have three tracks. When analyzing SNP arrays, the first step is to look at the log two ratio and verify that the overall genome reading hovers around zero or normal. Just like in ACGH arrays, Deviations upwards are likely amplifications or insertions, and deviations downwards are deletions. The second step is to look at the allylic tracks and identify any SNP abnormalities. Now, this example is normal. You would expect three tracks and your log two ratio hovering around zero. In this example, the log two ratio for the entire chromosome hovers below zero at around negative 0.5. This indicates a monosomy, in this case, monosomy X in Turner syndrome. The allylic tracks only display hemizygous A and hemizygous B. 
since the complementary X chromosome is absent, you cannot have a second partner at the individual SNP loci. Another example, the log 2 ratio for this segment of chromosome hovers above 0, around 0 0.5, indicating there is more genetic material at this segment. Because of the excess genetic material, we now have introduced an additional permutation to the SNP array. The allylic tracks display all possible allylic combinations in a duplication. AAA, AAB, ABB, and BBB. This is what a duplication looks like on a SNP array. In this example, we see how the SNP array differs from ACGH arrays by providing further information. Here, the log 2 for the entire chromosome hovers around 0. On a typical ACGH array, this would be interpreted as normal. However, on this SNP array, the heterozygous AB is absent. This defect would not be picked up by fish or karyotype. This is what a copy-neutral loss of heterozygosity looks like. This can happen as a result of errors in meiosis, where a person receives two copies of a chromosome or part of a chromosome from one parent. This is called uniparental disomy. Because you still have two copies of the overall genetic material in this region, there is no change in the copy number. Hence, the log 2 ratio remains normal. However, because you only have one source of genetic material in this region, it is impossible to have heterozygous SNPs, hence the loss of heterozygous tracts. In addition to imprinting disorders, this finding can be significant for some neoplastic conditions as well. Let's practice these concepts. Here is a SNP array for chromosome 11. Assuming this segment of data, is the same throughout the entire chromosome. What is the abnormality shown here? The answer is trisomy 11. The log 2 ratio hovers around positive 0 0.5 and there is an additional allylic track uh, signifying an additional permutation of SNPs from this extra chromosome. The significance of copy number variations in disease is still being investigated. Fortunately, there is a growing database of peer-reviewed publications that allow us to compare our microarray data to the literature in order to come to some meaningful conclusion. Ultimately, the diagnostic significance falls under four classifications. The abnormality is either known to be pathogenic, a variant of likely pathologic significance, a variant of unknown significance, or we know it to be completely benign. Microarray studies can be used in a number of ways, such as in the detection of hematologic malignancies, such as CLL, or mutations in solid tumors, like renal cell and melanoma. And they can be used in prenatal and postnatal diagnosis of genetic diseases, Again, as we continue to understand the significance of these variations, the utility of microarrays will increase. Microarray analysis does have its limits, though. Uh, they don't have the genomic resolution to detect point mutations. Remember that SNPs are not mutations. They can struggle to detect balanced chromosomal arrangements, such as translocations and inversions. And while the microarray are designed to look at thousands of loci within the genome, there are hundreds of thousands of other loci not being looked at. So it is not a complete picture of the genomic material. Rather, it is only as good as the array chip is set up to be. And lastly, microarrays do not detect epigenetic alterations. If you would like to look into some of the available databases on copy number variants and their significance, I have included some of the resources here for you. Amplification techniques. 
Nucleic acid amplification can be classified into three broad categories. The one you are likely most familiar with are the targeted amplification systems, which include polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, and transcription-mediated amplification, or TMA. There is also the probe amplification system, such as LCR, and signal amplification, like hybrid capture. But for our purposes, we will be focusing on PCR and TMA. Regardless of the system, however, there are some universal basic components. You need to have nucleic acid substrates, also called deoxynucleotide triphosphates, or DNTPs. These are the building blocks of your DNA amplicon, your DNA amplification product. You need to have primers to target the sequence you wish to amplify and to begin the amplification process. You need to have polymerase enzymes that polymerize the substrates into the final amplicon product. And a buffering solution to make the molecular environment for this process favorable. For PCR, there are three basic steps. You denature the target sequence, you anneal the primers to that target sequence, and then you synthesize a new strand of DNA. These steps take place in a thermocycler, which allows the temperature to change as needed for each step. Since each parameter contains multiple variables to play with, the thermocycler can be programmed in order to optimize this process. After enough cycles, the product is isolated, generally by electrophoresis, though other methods also exist. Here, the nucleotides are in small blue blocks, the primer in red, and the target sequence in green. The target sequence is denatured, the primers are allowed to anneal to their complementary sequence, and this allows the polymerase enzyme to bind and begin the elongation process. The cycle is then repeated multiple times to increase the amplicon products for analysis. In this example, the PCR products are examined on gel electrophoresis. M is the DNA ladder, or marker, containing different sizes of DNA products. It serves as a, as a ruler to help us determine if the products we amplified are at least within the size range that we expected. If your PCR product is not the expected size, you should consider contamination. Beta-actin is a housekeeping gene that serves as um, an internal control for the process, verifying proper nucleic acid extraction and quality of the product used in PCR. Each number on the left represents a patient or cell line. Cell lines 1 and 2 are testing positive for EBV, while cell line 3 is testing negative. There are several variations of the PCR technique, each with their advantages and limitations, but at their core, they all follow the same basic principles. We won't cover the differences here. I'll leave that to you if you wish to pursue. I do, however, want to mention transcription-based amplification, or TMA, as it does have some useful advantages over PCR. The first thing to know of TMA is the target sequence for amplification is RNA, not DNA. The advantage here is you start out with a lot of targets. For every cell, there's only one DNA target, but hundreds, thousands of RNA transcripts. So the amplification process is much quicker. Since we are starting with an RNA target, Reverse transcriptase is used instead of polymerase. Reverse transcriptase does as it says. It synthesizes a complementary DNA strand from an RNA template. This newly synthesized cDNA strand then provides the template for synthesis of multiple RNA strands, which then re-enter the cycle. So, in effect, every cycle results in hundreds to thousands of amplicons produced. In PCR, every cycle sees a doubling of amplicon products, so this drastically 
increases the efficiency and turnaround time with TMA. Additionally, the entire process is isothermal. There's no need to cycle temperatures um, in order for the process to progress. This table compares TMA with PCR. As you can see, TMA requires less equipment, meaning it is cheaper. It is much, much faster than PCR for the reasons we discussed. And because RNA is generally more labile than DNA, the risk of contamination is actually decreased. It also helps that there are fewer steps to setting up TMA than PCR. TMA also seems to avoid issues with endogenous inhibitors, which include hemoglobin and urea that can interfere with PCR-based amplification. Additionally, TMA is more sensitive to bacterial detection and is more easily applied to the detection of RNA viruses. Nucleic acid amplification provides the foundations for genetic sequencing techniques, which we will discuss here. The gold standard for sequencing is Sanger method, which was introduced in the 70s. Since then, many other sequencing methods have been developed, culminating into the next generation sequencing techniques. We will cover the more popular methods here, starting with Sanger sequencing. The process is set up like any other PCR with the addition of dideoxynucleotides, or DDNTP. These nucleotides differ from the standard DNTPs in that they terminate polymerization of the DNA strand during amplification. For example, if the polymerase enzyme incorporates a DDATP at the elongating strand, it terminates elongation and moves on. Doing this for the remaining nucleic acids, T, C, and G, eventually results in various amplicon sizes, which can then be sorted by size to determine which nucleotide follows which. This is better represented by the image here on the left. Here, each DDNTP is fluorescently labeled a different color, which aids in its detection. During elongation, as the polymerase enzyme comes across a DDNTP, it terminates polymerization of that DNA strand, leaving a truncated amplicon. Eventually, you end up with a series of truncated amplicons, each containing one more nucleotide than the other. This collection of various sized amplicons can then be separated by gel electrophoresis, as it was done in the earlier days of Sanger sequencing. Or alternatively, the amplicon products can be passed through capillary electrophoresis, which also separates them by size. As they pass through the capillary, a laser light excites the fluorophores attached to the DDNTPs, and a detector reads out the nucleotides in order as they pass through, generating the genetic sequence. This process is slow, taking almost 10 years to sequence the first human genome. Next generation sequencing does the same thing on a much larger scale, drastically speeding up the process. It does this by sequencing fragments of the DNA in parallel. With the various technologies developed in NGS, entire genomes can be sequenced in days instead of years. But we haven't completely moved on from Sanger sequencing, as it is still considered the gold standard. NGS platforms are validated against the Sanger method. NGS methods can largely be classified into four groups. Uh, pyro sequencing, sequencing by synthesis, sequencing by ligation, and ion semiconductor sequencing. I will not be discussing the technical aspects of each of these groups. I have included a link to a wonderful introductory uh, video by Applied Biologic Materials that goes over these NGS groups, as well as Sanger sequencing. If you wish to uh, review that, feel free to click the link on the video, or you can find the link in the description below.
let's discuss how the data is released and interpreted. The basic functions of NGS is to take multiple fragments of sample DNA and amplify these fragments in parallel at the same time, right? These fragments are then sequenced and aligned against a reference genome for comparison. Now, there are two terms you should be familiar with, coverage and read depth. Coverage is how much of the reference genome has been covered by the fragments of DNA from your NGS. For example, if your reference genome is 50 megabases and your NGS platform has sequenced 45 megabases, then you have 90% coverage. Most of the time, coverage is not 100%, as certain regions are difficult to sequence or alignment may be faulty due to repetitive sequences in other places. There are ways to check for these, and more advanced systems are addressing these shortcomings. Now, read depth is how many times a single nucleotide or a region within your reference genome was sequenced by the NGS platform. Now, the relationship between coverage and depth is inversely proportional. As you increase your read depth, you decrease your coverage, but you increase your accuracy at finding a mutation. Decreasing read depth will decrease your accuracy, but increase your overall coverage of the genome. It is recommended to have a read depth of at least 100 for tumor genetics. Here is what that data actually looks like. The reference genome is located here at the bottom. The protein sequence located below that. Each gray bar above that is an independent read, a fragment from the NGS platform. And these fragments have been aligned to that reference genome, hence the gaps. At the top is a red bar indicating the area of the genome that we are looking at. In this case, the p-arm of an unknown chromosome. We see at the center of the data stream several reads reporting the presence of guanine instead of adenine at this one position. This does not automatically mean there is a mutation. If this difference is present in approximately 50% of the reads, it is more likely a SNP. If it is present in only a few of the reads, then it is more likely to be a mutation. From here, you will need to refer to a database of reported genetic alterations to determine if the mutation is pathogenic, of likely pathologic significance, of uncertain significance, or completely benign, as we discussed earlier in reporting microarray data. The use of NGS technology has been increasing in several areas of medicine. However, there still remain substantial obstacles to its adoption. For example, uh, the need for expertise and training, bioinformatics resources for data analysis, equipment costs and reimbursements, and the cost of storing large amounts of data. Clonality testing. The idea behind clonality testing is to determine if a population of B lymphocytes are derived from a single clone or are polyclonal. This is accomplished by looking at the distribution of VDJ segments. If the cells are polyclonal, then there will be a Gaussian distribution for the size of the final VDJ constructs. If there is a clonal process, then only one VDJ construct is being produced. It is important to note that a clonal population is not necessarily synonymous with malignancy. There are benign and reactive conditions that can also result in clonal B cells, and so it is important to interpret the results within the larger clinical and histomorphological picture. 
As a refresher, the immunoglobulin heavy genes have several V, D, J, and C segments. Immunoglobulin light chains, kappa and lambda, also have several V, J, and C segments, but they lack D. An immunoglobulin has an FAB region and an FC region. The FC region is constant. The FAB region, AB standing for antigen binding, is the variable region of the immunoglobulin. The variability of this region is the result of splicing and recombining various segments together in different combinations at the genomic level. As a result, in a polyclonal population, B cells will have varying lengths of their VDJ sequence, producing a Gaussian distribution of sequence lengths. In a clonal population, all the cells have the same exact sequence length, resulting in a single recombinant product. The presence of testing for a clonal cell population can be done either by antibody-based methods, such as flow cytometry and immunohistochemistry, or nucleic acid-based methods, such as PCR and NGS. At the moment, PCR, followed by capillary electrophoresis, is considered the gold standard. PCR primers are designed towards specific regions of the Ig heavy and Ig kappa genes. The specifics might be too much information, but in case you are interested, for Ig heavy uh, gene, these include various VH families within frameworks 1, 2, and 3 and a consensus primer for the JH segment. For Ig kappa light chain, uh, tube A includes primers to V kappa and J kappa, while tube B includes V kappa, JC kappa, uh, the deletion element IgKde. Ig lambda is not usually tested as over 95% of clonal rearrangements can be picked up from IgH and Ig kappa. After amplifying these regions and passing the PCR product through capillary electrophoresis, we combine a readout of the amplicon lengths as you see here. Here we are looking at framework regions 1 and 3 from the IgH gene and the B tube of Ig kappa. Again, in a polyclonal population from sample 1, you would expect to have various lengths to the amplification product and therefore a Gaussian distribution. Compare this to a clonal population from sample 2 where only one amplicon length exists resulting in a single peak. And this peak is usually a lot higher in signal intensity than the polyclonal populations flow cytometry. Flow cytometry is an extremely useful tool in hematopathology as well as the research setting where single cell suspensions are used. The technology allows us to evaluate cell size, cytoplasmic complexity, and immunophenotype. And it can do this pretty rapidly, analyzing tens of thousands of cells per second. Clinically, it is commonly used for hematologic abnormalities and malignancies, PNH testing, HLA-B27, immunodeficiency, uh, and minimal residual disease testing, among other things. The way this works is cells pass through a tube one cell at a time. As the cells pass in front of the laser light, the light source is eclipsed and the amount of light blocked is read by the forward detector as the cell size. Also, as light passes through the cell, it becomes scattered away from the midline. The more contents within a cell cytoplasm, the more scatter that results. This is read by the side detectors as complexity of the cell. 
The computer then processes these results and displays them in a scatter plot. Here, side scatter is Y and forward scatter is X. Here we see the lymphocytes have a less complex cytoplasm, uh, resulting in a low side scatter, and neutrophils, uh, having granules within their cytoplasm, have a much higher side scatter. In hematopathology, the cells show a better separation of the various populations with the use of CD45 instead of forward scatter, and so you will more often see a CD45 versus side scatter plot. For immunophenotyping, various antibodies tagged with fluorophores are used to coat the cell suspension prior to analysis. The fluorescent light produced by exciting the fluorophores is detected by specific detectors to the fluorophores used. For example, green fluorescence from CD4 antibodies is detected by a green detector and red signal from CD8 antibodies is detected by a red detector, and so on. Lastly, you can isolate certain populations of cells through a process called gating. Basically, with the analysis software, you can draw a box, or any shape really, around a population of interest and the machine will gate that population out for you, allowing you to see how the population of cells look under other plots. As demonstrated on the bottom of the diagram, you can choose to sort and isolate cells based on their immunophenotype, though this is usually done in a research setting rather than for clinical use, uh, known as fax sorting. When it comes to interpreting flow cytometry and hematopathology, it is helpful to have some knowledge of the immunophenotypes of normal cells and the patterns of maturation that these cells undergo. Since this is an introductory lecture, I will reserve the flow patterns and malignant aberrancies for another time, and instead focus on the normal immunophenotypes you should be familiar with. And I think Henry's has done a great job of this. We will start with B cells. As depicted in the following tables, the darker the color, the higher the antigen expression will be. CD45, also known as leukocyte common antigen, will be expressed at varying levels on all hematopoietic cells and serves as an initial separator of the various blood cells on flow cytometry, as we'll see in a second. CD34 is a stem cell marker that can be found on all immature cells, such as blasts. Terminal deoxynucleotidyl transferase, or TDT, is found in all early lymphocytes, and it is responsible for adding nucleotides to the V, D, and J exons uh, on your T cell and B cell receptor genes. CD10, also known as common ALL antigen, is an early B cell marker found on your hematogones and follicular B cells. CD19 and CD20 are important B cell markers, as is HLADR, an antigen presenting peptide. CD38 is a nonspecific marker expressed on all B cells and in higher levels on plasma cells. Plasma cells will also express CD138, which is not shown here. And lastly, mature B cells will express either kappa or lambda light chains, not both. Again, CD34 and TDT on immature T lymphocytes as expected. CD2, CD3, CD5, and CD7 are pan T cell markers, with CD2 and CD3 being the most specific for T cells. In the thymus during T cell development, T cells will co-express CD4 and CD8 and eventually pick one or the other. As they mature, they gain more surface CD3 along with T cell antigen receptor or TCR. Remember that CD3 and TCR actually form a complex with one another and this is an important milestone in thymocyte development. 
CD117 is found on myeloid progenitor cells. CD13 and 33 are pan-myeloid markers expressed on granulocytes, monocytes, and even macrophage progenitors. Neutrophils can be distinguished from eosinophils and monocytes based on the expression of both CD15 and CD16, along with dim CD14 expression. Other common markers used to identify neutrophils include CD66B, CD11B, and cytoplasmic marker myeloperoxidase, or MPO, which is not shown here. Monocytes show expression of CD13 and 33. Monoblasts lack 117 expression, distinguishing these cells from myeloblasts. As antigen-presenting cells, we expect HLA-DR to be present. Monocytes are subdivided into three major populations. The classical, which are CD14 positive, CD16 negative. Non-classical, CD14 dim, CD16 positive and the intermediate, CD14 high, CD16 positive. Classical monocytes give rise to non-classical monocytes through the intermediate step. Classical monocytes are further distinguished from the other two subsets by additional markers, such as CD36 and CD64, which take part in host antimicrobial responses, such as adhesion to the endothelium, migration, and phagocytosis. Immunophenotypically speaking, monocytes are a very heterogeneous cell type with varying expression profiles depending on the location of the cell. So, for example, in circulation, monocytes express CD11B, while in extravascular sites, they possess higher levels of CD11C and HLA-DR. Erythroblasts and proerythrocytes continue to express CD117 and eventually lose this expression as they mature. Reticulocytes will express CD71 and CD235A. With continued maturation, CD71 is lost while 235A is retained. Here is an example of the flow cytometry plots from a bone marrow aspirate. The large scatter plot to the left is an ungated plot Again, CD45 replaces the forward scatter to better separate the cell populations and is a marker of maturity in hematopoietic cells. Nucleated red cells and debris are found in the double negative region uh, located in the lower left corner, and the DIM45 uh, area contains your blasts. For the plots on the right, we've gated for lymphocytes, as indicated in the brackets at the top of each scatter plot. In these plots, we've colored T cells blue and B cells red to help us visualize their immunophenotypes. And these results are normal. The T and B cells are expressing the appropriate markers the kappa and lambda light chains show a polyclonal distribution. Here are results from a PNH panel, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. If you recall, PNH is the result of a pig A gene mutation that disrupts the production of GPI anchoring molecules. This results in a decrease of protective membrane bound proteins. The gold standard for diagnosing PNH is flow cytometry, which looks for the presence of the anchoring proteins. CD55, which is the complement decay accelerating factor, or DAF, and CD59, which is the MAC inhibitory protein. On the left, we have a gated population of red cells, and we are looking at the expression of CD59. The population in red are red cells with complete expression of CD59. The blue population are red cells with complete loss of CD59 expression. Red cells with partial loss would fall somewhere in between, if present. In addition, we use another marker called flare. 
This is a fluorescently labeled bacterial toxin called aerolysin that binds to GPI anchors. So if GPI anchors are absent, flare expression will be reduced. On the gated plots to the right, we see a subpopulation of neutrophils and monocytes with decreased flare expression, indicating a loss of the GPI anchors. The last thing I want to touch upon is minimal residual disease testing, or MRD. The detection of minimal residual disease has primarily been used in acute leukemias for guiding therapies and for prognosis. Let's say a patient has a new diagnosis of BALL. A flow cytometric analysis at the time of diagnosis identifies a unique immunophenotype that separates these neoplastic B cells from the rest of the normal B cells. The patient then receives induction chemotherapy. Now we want to know how well that therapy did at eliminating the leukemic lymphoblasts. And this is where MRD flow comes in. MRD analysis requires that you have previous knowledge of the neoplastic immunophenotype you are looking for, and that you acquire a large number of cell events using a tailored antibody panel to that immunophenotype. The technique requires at least 500,000 analyzed cell events and is sensitive enough to detect one leukemic blast in 10,000 cells. MSI testing. Microsatellites are short tandem repeats, or STRs. These are areas of repeating DNA sequences, usually between two and seven nucleotides long, that repeat several dozen times. These occur in thousands of places throughout the genome, naturally, and are the testing targets for paternity tests, forensic DNA identification, and even tracking cancer evolution. The problem with STRs are the repeating sequences. As polymerase goes over these repeating sequences during replication, it can skip and end up introducing errors to the newly synthesized DNA. MSI testing is typically performed on tumors of colonic or endometrial origin to determine if the patient is at risk of Lynch syndrome. Alterations of specific microsatellite regions within mismatch repair enzymes have been found in over 90% of hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancers, also known as Lynch syndrome, and around 15% of all colorectal cancers. They have also been found in up to 30% of endometrial tumors. When it comes to colorectal cancers, there are three major pathways. Number one, the conventional adenoma carcinoma sequence with the activation of oncogenes, such as KRAS, and inactivation of tumor suppressor genes, such as APC and P53. This results in a microsatellite stable, or MSS, cancer. The second pathway is a microsatellite instability pathway, or MSI, which is the result of, an, of a mismatch repair enzyme deficiency, an MMR deficiency, such as that seen in Lynch syndrome, resulting in MSI high cancers. The serrated pathway, with CPG island methylation, uh, resulting in either MSI high or MSS cancers, depending on whether the methylation occurs in a microsatellite uh, promoter or a tumor suppressor gene, respectively. Methylation of MLH1 promoter, resulting in repressed expression of the MLH1 gene, is most common cause of MSI in colorectal tumors and accounts for approximately 12% of all colorectal cancers. Again, MSI is a subset of the total colorectal cancer population. BRAF V600E mutations are actually not very common. So the goal of MSI testing is to look at the integrity 
of microsatellites associated with DNA mismatch repair genes. And we target two pairs of mismatch repair genes, MLH1, PMS2, and MSH2, MSH6. The order of these pairs is important because the first enzyme in those pairs are absolutely necessary for the second to function. Meaning, if you have a defect in MLH1, PMS2 will be defective. If MSH2 is defective, MSH6 is also defective. But these relationships are not reversible. The reason this is important in the first place is because a defect of these mismatch repair enzymes leads to a better prognosis for the patient. MSI screening is done with either IHC or PCR. PCR has about a 90% sensitivity, while IHC is about 85%. Some institutions will perform both, bringing the sensitivity close to 100%. The results of testing are categorized in one of three ways. Either you have MSI high, meaning more than one mismatch repair enzyme is defective, or you have MSI low, meaning only one mismatch repair enzyme is defective, or you have MSS, where no mismatch repair enzymes are defective. There are essentially two ways we look for these defects. The first is by screening with IHC. For IHC, we are confirming the presence of MMR enzyme by positive staining. The lack of an enzyme results in a negative stain. So in this example, the lack of PMS2 staining signifies an MSI low result. A lack of staining in MLH1 or MSH2 automatically results in an MSI high result since these are the dominant partners in their respective pairings, as we discussed a couple slides back. The problem with IHC is that it tells you nothing about the genetics of the problem. Antibodies are directed against the protein. An abnormal IHC result helps narrow the focus of additional genetic testing to determine if germline mutation of the MMR genes has occurred. There's one more thing to mention about MLH1. If IHC staining is missing for MLH1, then the next step is to test for BRAF V600E mutations and MLH1 promoter hypermethylation. If either of these is present, then the sporadic MSI tumor is favored over Lynch syndrome. Ultimately, genetic counseling is required in all suspected cases of Lynch syndrome. The alternative to IHC screening is PCR-based MSI testing. Here, a PCR electropherogram showing microsatellite instability in five of five mononucleotide markers from a colorectal carcinoma. Normal tissue from the same patient is shown at the top for comparison. For PCR, there are five microsatellite markers tested. This is one example of a testing algorithm. Here we start with IHC testing. The loss of MLH1 requires further investigation into the BRAF status of the tumor. If BRAF is mutated, we consider this a sporadic MSI tumor. If BRAF is intact, we move on to MLH hypermethylation testing. If the MLH promoter is normal, then genetic testing for germline mutation of MLH1 and PMS2 is done. If the promoter is hypermethylated, we label this a sporadic MSI. If we have an MSI high or an MSI low that does not include MLH1 loss, these go straight to genetic testing and counseling for Lynch syndrome. If all MMR proteins are present, we label it microsatellite stable or MSS. Now, it turns out MSI is not exclusive to colorectal or endometrial tumors. 
MSI has been found in various tumors throughout the body, and some have argued that every tumor should get MSI testing because there is now an FDA-approved drug for all MSI tumors. In 2010, the FDA approved PDL1 and PD1 inhibitors such as Keytruda and Opdivo for use in all MSI high tumors. These drugs block the co-stimulatory signals that allow tumors to evade the immune system. Now there is growing talk about tumor mutational burden or TMB. TMB is another pan-tumor biomarker like MSI and is based on NGS sequencing. The idea is if a tumor has a high enough mutational burden, it will be producing new antigens for the immune system to recognize. These checkpoint inhibitors assist the immune-mediated attack of the tumor cells producing these aberrant antigens by blocking the co-stimulation of PD-1 receptors on cytotoxic T cells. And there is growing evidence of PDL1 inhibitors having a tremendous effect in these cases. We are also learning that not all MSI high colorectal tumors have been responding the same to this new drug therapy. It was found that not all MSI high tumors had a high TMB. And in fact, MSS patients with tumors have been shown to have high TMB. So now there is a move to base these therapies on high TMB groups rather than MSI high groups. Methylation analysis. If you recall from the previous lecture, methylation occurs on the five prime carbon of the cytosine base. This typically occurs over CPG islands within the DNA, which are areas where C and G bases are plentiful. A lot of gene promoters have these CPG islands, and methylation of these regions result in repressed transcription, usually through chromatin condensation and thus blocking of transcription factors. Methylation is a normal function of DNA regulation. It allows for genomic imprinting and X chromosome inactivation. Aberrant methylation is associated with disease states and likely plays a role in all neoplasia. We actually mentioned an example of this in the previous section. Remember that hypermethylation of the MLH1 promoter region is the most common cause of sporadic microsatellite and stable colorectal cancers. Bisulfite conversion is the most common method for methylation analysis and is the one we will be focusing on here. It uses sodium bisulfite to convert unmethylated cytosines to uracil. If cytosine is methylated, nothing happens. The product of both bisulfite treated and untreated DNA are then sequenced. The untreated DNA thus acts as a reference in this case. Upon sequencing, the uracil bases are replaced with thymine. If cytosine has been replaced with thymine, this indicates methylation was not present. Non-bisulfite dependent methods include restriction endonucleases and affinity enrichment. Briefly, restriction endonuclease digestion using HPA2, which cannot cleave methylated CPG islands, and MSP1, which can cleave CPG sequences regardless of methylation status, are used. The resulting DNA is then analyzed using either gel electrophoresis, microarray hybridization, or even NGS. This method has a high false positive rate due to incomplete digestion. Affinity enrichment relies on methylated DNA immunoprecipitation, or methyl CPG binding domain-based capture, to purify the methylated DNA. The product is then hybridized to a microarray or analyzed with NGS. This method is used primarily in the research setting. 
Here is a sample readout of DNA methylation status following bisulfite conversion. The top results show bisulfite conversion of a human pluripotent stem cell. And being a stem cell, we would expect there to be mostly unmethylated and therefore active transcription. As you can see in the gray boxes, there are practically no cytosine bases indicating bisulfite conversion had occurred. The bottom shows methylation status in the same DNA region of a differentiated cell. Here we see preservation of the cytosine bases, thus indicating these were methylated and unable to undergo bisulfite conversion. Areas where this technology can be used clinically include looking at the epigenetic status of tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes, as well as in the prognostic calculation and therapeutic considerations for disease.